Welcome to the Wisdom That Breathes channel. Across all our platforms, we try to share wisdom which is relevant and accessible to everyone. But on this particular platform, we go deeper into some of the ancient principles found within the scriptures. If you find some of the terminology difficult or inaccessible, then go over to our Keshava Swami YouTube channel where you'll be able to find other content which is perhaps more relatable. Thank you and enjoy the wisdom that breathes. Shrimad Bhagavatam, Canto number 1, Chapter number 13, entitled Dhritarashtra Quits Home. And today we're reading from text number 24. Agnir Nishishta Dattascha, Agnir Nishishta Dattascha, Dharashtra Dushita, Dharashtra Dushita, Shetram Dhanam Yesha, Shetram Dhanam Shetram Dhanam Yesha, Translation, there is no need to live a degraded life and subsist on the charity of those whom you tried to kill by arson and poisoning. You also insulted one of their wives 
and assert their kingdom and wealth. Therefore, the system of Varnashram religion sets aside a part of one's life completely for the purpose of self realization and attainment of salvation in the human form of life. That is a routine division of life, but persons like Dhritarashtra, even at their weary, ripened age, want to stay home, even in a degraded condition of accepting charity from enemies. Vidura wanted to point this out and impressed upon him that it was better to die like his sons than accept such humiliating charity. <laughs> 5,000 years ago, there was one Dhritarashtra, but at the present moment, there are Dhritarashtras in every home. Politicians especially do not retire from political activities unless they are dragged by the cruel hand of death or killed by some opposing element. To stick to family life to the end of one's human life is the grossest type of degradation and there is an absolute need for the Viduras to educate such Dhritarashtras even at the present moment. Srila Prabhupada is yeah. a competition between Vidura and Srila Prabhupada who can be heavier. <laughs> Omagyana Timiranta Sigyana Jana Shalakaya Chakshura Nara Bhima Tasmai Shira Vena Maha Shri Chaitanya Amram Vishnam Sarkitam Yena Bhutale Sayam Rupa Kata Mayam Dadati Swatanantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yata Paramalam Shri Guru Vaishnavam Shya Shri Rupam Sarajatam Sarana Ravana Handikam Vamsa Jeeva Sarveta Sarvutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Varam Sarana Lamata Shri Sakra Namasta E Krishna Karana Sindhu Mina Bandhu Jagapate Kopesha Kopita Panda Radha Panda Namaste Tapetanshana Gorangi Rade Vinda Veshwari Vishavanu Sude Devi Pranamani Hari Pire Vansha Bhagavaru Krishna Kripa Sindhu Vyarucha Abhira Mahavane Pyo Vaishnava Pyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Adhita Kadatara Shiva Sindhu Vakramita Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare this section of the Bhagavatam is basically talking about all these personalities who went back to the spiritual world. The Pandavas at one point desire to re retire and then they go back to the spiritual world and we hear about their journey. Draupadi, Subhadra, they all realize that this is also the time to leave, so then they are also leaving. In this section, we also hear about Bhishma Dev leaving the world. And in this section, we also hear about Krishna leaving the world. So this whole section of the first canto of the Bhagavatam is giving the accounts of all the different personalities who... Uh, were leaving the world and in what consciousness they left the world. So here, as we were mentioning yesterday, Vidura is realizing Dhritarashtra, his time is also coming. So Vidura is trying to train him. Of course, Srila Prabhupada, when he was leaving the world, he also said to his disciples, don't think that this will not happen to you. So that reality of preparing for, uh, for death is a reality that everyone will have to face. But for Dhritarashtra here is very, very uh, acute. So Vidura is trying to train him what does it mean to 
to actually attain perfection at the time of death. And what Vidura is trying to do is basically change the mentality of Dhritarashtra. Very interesting, when Vidura and Dhritarashtra come face to face in this part of the Bhagavatam, you can basically see two polar opposite types of mentality. Dhritarashtra, he lived his whole life in victim mentality. Whereas Vidura was always in gratitude mentality. You see, Vidura was so qualified, he... Vidura was so qualified, he was so sharp, he was so smart, he was so... Um, his character was spotless in all ways. His only disqualification was that he was born from a maidservant. So in one sense, Vidura had so much opportunity to become a victim if he wanted to. Because he could have said, I have everything. I should be in the position. And just because I was born from a maidservant, why should I have uh, be put at a disadvantage? But Vidura never turned in that way. He was always grateful. Whatever my position is, whatever the Supreme Lord has ordained, that is good. Vidura was in gratitude mentality, but, uh, but Dhritarashtra, his whole life, he was in a victim mentality. See, he was not seeing that uh, I am blind, but I have been graced with so many things around me. He was not seeing that. He was seeing that I have been graced with many things around me, but I am blind. Can you see the difference? Two people will see the same things, but they'll focus on something different. So Dhritarashtra, his whole life, he was in victim mentality, uh, always dissatisfied. So Vidura said, if you want to go back to Godhead, you've got to change this mentality. You've got to change from being a victim to being grateful. If you look at Vidura in his life, he was always flexible and fearless. When he was insulted um, by Dhritarashtra, he was flexible. He realized, no, it's not time for me to be here now. I need to leave. I need to leave the palace and go to the forest. And he was fearless. Krishna will maintain me. Krishna will take care of me. So Vidura was fearless and flexible. But Dhritarashtra, his whole life, he was rigid. He was fixed. And he was very, very fearful. In fact, his name, Dhritarashtra, Dhri means to, to hold, and Rashtra means the land. So he was so attached, he was so holding on, uh, fixed and rigid in his mentality. Whereas uh, Vidura was just ready to leave according to the plans of Krishna. So unless we become fearless and flexible, ready to move with Krishna's plan, ready to fully embrace it, ready to take it into our heart, you can't go back to Godhead. If you're fixed and rigid and fearful, trying to hold on to everything, then you will have to remain here. So Vidura is trying to change his mentality. Um, Vidura was always in a forgiving mentality. Isn't it? Even after everything Dhritarashtra had said and done, even then Vidura still came back to try to help him. But Dhritarashtra, his mentality was always to hold a grudge. Till the final day, you know it said that even though Dhritarashtra eventually left, and even though he went to the north, and it said that he attained perfection, it said that Dhritarashtra didn't actually attain pure love. And you know what the reason was? There was one thing in Dhritarashtra's mentality that even when he went and he renounced and attained perfection, stopped him from getting pure love for Krishna. And you know what it was? He still had some animosity towards the Pandavas. 
In his heart, he still felt, they killed my sons. That means if you have any negativity towards a devotee, if you have any kinds of grudges that you're holding, that will block the development of love for Krishna in your heart. So can you see, Vidura is trying to bring Dhritarashtra over to a different mentality. He's trying to bring Dhritarashtra away from being the victim to being grateful, away from being fixed and rigid to being flexible and fearless, away from being uh, constantly grudging and, uh, and embracing uh, forgiveness. Because unless you do these things, you can't go back to God. So, it's just a very, very powerful point that we can think about. Because this is basically the tension that we're dealing with in our own life. Are we more of the Dhritarashtra mentality or more of the Vidura mentality? The more you're part of the Vidura mentality, then the doors to the spiritual world are opening. So Vidura wants to open those doors for Dhritarashtra. And so in this verse, he's saying, and Srila Prabhupada is emphasizing, that eventually everyone has to start letting go of everything in this world. Because if you've noticed, the waves of time gradually strip everyone of everything. And therefore, Rather than letting time take it away forcibly, before that happens, if you become detached from it within, then it will be far less painful and far less bewildering. As we walk through this world, and as we live through this journey of life, we get certain identities, we get certain facilities, and we're also given certain abilities. But the teaching of the Vedas is that we utilize those identities, facilities and abilities for Krishna. But eventually, you have to give up all of those identities, facilities and abilities. Because when time goes to zero, Krishna will take all of those things away. And so if you're holding on to those things, then at the time of death, it will be very, very painful. It will be uh, very, very difficult. So it's like, for example, when you have a plaster on your hand, there are two options when you want to take it off. Option number one is just rip it off. And option number two is go under a tap, run some nice hot water and then gradually start peeling it off which one would you go for there are some diehards who would do number one but most of us would say i'll go for the humane option and i'll just go under the tap and do it nicely less painful so do you want material nature to strip you of uh, strip you of everything violently then at the end of life, it will be very difficult to think of Krishna. So if someone is wise, then what they'll do is start giving up everything before it's taken away from them. When uh, Pariksha realized that he only had seven days to live, then the Bhagavatam explains, Atma Jaya Sutta Gara Pashu Bandushu Raja Chavi Kale Nityam Virudham Pariksha realized he had only seven days left to live. So what did he do? The first thing he gave up, Jaya, his wife. Second thing he gave up, Sutta, his children. Third thing he gave up, Agada, his palace. Fourth thing he gave up, Pashu, his animals, his cavalry. Fifth thing he gave up, Dravina, his treasury. Sixth thing he gave up, Bandushu, his friends. And seventh thing he gave up, Rajay, his kingdom. 
Now, if you think about it, if you take those seven things away, you're not really left with much. The only thing he was left with after giving those seven things up was his own body. But for his own body, he realized, if I go to the bank of the Ganga and I hear Bhagavatam, then I go beyond the bodily conception of life and therefore I'll even be detached from my body before I die. So, if someone hasn't given up these eight things by the time they breathe their last breath, then there's a good chance you're going to be thinking about one of these eight things. Either you're going to think of your partner, or you're going to think of your palace, or you're going to think of your money, or you're going to think of your friends, or you're going to think of your identity and position, or you're going to think of... Uh, your cavalry, I guess in modern terms, that would be the car that you have. You might think of your Tesla or something. You're not going to think of an elephant or anything like that. But. So seven of the eight, <coughs> Pariksit realized, I've got seven days to live. So seven of the eight, he gave up immediately. And the last one, he realized, I'll transcend it through hearing and chanting. So therefore, Srila Prabhupada says, Varnashram is very, very scientific. Because the idea is that gradually as time goes by, you basically detach yourself from everything in this world. They say Brahmachari Ashram means you learn. Grihastha Ashram means you earn. Vanaprastha Ashram means you turn. And sannyas ashram means you burn. <laughs> Hopefully you return, return back home, back to God. That's basically the science of Varanashram. First you learn how to live in this world. What's the purpose of life? And then you earn. You get stable, you get secure, you get comfortable in this world. And from there you develop spiritual knowledge. And then when the time comes, turn. Start turning the ship around. Start winding things up. Prabhupada says, don't be in family life till the end of life. It's, uh, I mean, Prabhupada is saying, I'm not saying. <laughs> don't shoot the messenger. He said, it's the grossest type of ignorance. Of course, now I have to soften it. <laughs> to be hurt. Yeah, sometimes we may have to adjust. But the point is that we need to uh, let go, turn. And then whether one formally takes sannyas or not, that's not so important. But the idea is that one should finally be fully absorbed, fully detached, fully uh, separate from all concerns in this world. So uh, Varanashram is very, very scientific. And in this way, uh, Vidura is encouraging Dhritarashtra uh, to start uh, letting it go, to start giving things up. And uh, it's very, very exciting, actually. The final part of one's life, the last 50 years of one's life, in the material world, they think the first 50 years of your life are the exciting years. And then it all goes downhill. That's how they think in the material world. But actually in spiritual culture, it's the other way around. For a devotee, the first 50 years are the difficult ones. Because that's when you've got to navigate all the complexity of the material world, balance all your dharmas, you know, work for some corporate shark that makes you stay up till 12 midnight to earn some money. That's the hard part of life. The happy part of life is the second 50 years. Because that's when you can give everything up. That's when you can walk away. That's when you can go to Vrindavan. That's when you can absorb your heart and mind in hearing and chanting about Krishna without a care in the world. That is the business part of life. Mm -hmm. And so in spiritual culture, the last 50 years are the most, uh, most exciting because that's where all the doors to eternity are opening up. What do you think? Krishna Priya Guru, would you rather be your age or 15? My age. 
<laughs> it's complex. It would be complex to go all the way back and do it all over again. So many complexities. Better be out of the complexity. And now just nothing else to think about. Just to serve Krishna. So Vidura is trying to encourage Dhritarashtra. Why are you still trying to be in the first 50 years of your life, living in the palace, enjoying, trying to interface with the kingdom? You've done all that. You've been there. You've got the t-shirt. You've experienced it. Why are you still there? Don't lose your honor. Take advantage. You can come out now. And uh, in this way, he is uh, inspiring Dhritarashtra. When you're old, you can have actually more spiritual realization. And therefore we see Dhritarashtra, it, it happened in his old age. The first reason sometimes you can have more realization in your old age is because you've experienced many, many things in life. You've seen it. You've seen everything the Bhagavatam talks about. You've seen it before your eyes, happened before you. So you have more practical realization of material nature when you're older. Second thing is when you're older, generally your desires diminish. Because the body gets weaker, the senses get weaker, and uh, the hopes of some pleasure in the material world become also weaker. And therefore there's more chance for realization. The third reason why you can have more realizations in your older age is because uh, life has become less complex now. Not so many people are dependent on you. Children have grown up, other things have tied up. So you have more headspace, you have more opportunity. Um, and the fourth reason why in old age you can make more advancement sometimes is because death is around the corner it's right there right there around the corner waiting and therefore it's not just some concept that we're reading in the Bhagavatam now yes everyone will have to die but when you're young it's very difficult to understand that but when you're older all the signs are there it's coming around the corner and so there's an extra impetus, an extra um, urgency. So like this, so many gifts Krishna gives in the old age, in the older years, all to give us an impetus to wrap it up, to close the shop. See, you can't keep the shop open all night. Of course they do nowadays, especially if it's the Patel corner shop. At a certain point, even if there are customers, when the time comes, 5 p.m., 6 p.m., you just have to shut the door and you just have to get on with other things. Not that you just keep the shop open all night just to get a few more customers so you can earn a little bit more money. No, no. Why would you do that? You've earned the most of your money in the day. Now the time comes at 5 p.m., close up. Shut the shop and go and do something better. So here, Vidura is telling Dhritarashtra the same thing. It's time to close the shop. It's time to shut. It's time to just focus on Krishna. And so Prabhupada is saying that we uh, must remind each other of this. Hare Krishna. Okay, let me uh, just stop there and see whether anyone may have any comments or questions. Hey, Krishna Maharaj. You mentioned that in older age, it's easier to have more realizations for various reasons. Why is it that sometimes it may seem like people in their older age are finding it more difficult to take up a new practice like Krishna consciousness? And with what you said, is there a way to kind of break through that boundary? Yeah, generally it's very, very difficult for people to renounce in their old age because they never had a taste of renunciation before. That's why Brahmachari Gurukole Vasandanta Guru Orita 
Varnashram is very scientific. The idea is that everyone begins their life with a taste of renunciation. Then what happens is when you go through family life, then you have a comparison. This was family life, this was Brahmachari life. And after experiencing both at the age of 50 or 60, you're like, I think I want to go back to renunciation. But if you've never had that experience of renunciation, when the idea of giving everything up comes, it's very, very difficult because you haven't ever experienced anything else in your life. You don't know anything else. All you know is your identity in this world. And therefore, the idea of giving it up becomes very, very difficult. Like, say, for example, here, Srila Prabhupada is saying, politicians, they stay in their position until they get dragged out. Why? Because they don't know. If I leave this position, what will I do? Therefore, people can't move on from their positions because they have no other vision of what they're supposed to be doing. And therefore, it becomes very hard to renounce. But when one has a higher vision that, yeah, I've done my work. Now there's this amazing thing that I can absorb myself in. If, they have, if they've had some experience of that, it becomes much easier. And therefore, uh, it's always good. And if, if devotees haven't had the opportunity to live in a brahmacharya ashram or do that kind of thing, then at least what they should do is take times in the year where they fully absorb themselves in hearing and chanting. Because as you build up your capacity and your attraction to just being absorbed in Hari Kirtan and Hari Kata, as you develop a taste and an attraction for that, when the opportunity in your later years comes to give it all up and absorb yourself in Hari Kata, Hari Kirtan, you'll be very enthusiastic. But if you've never developed an attraction for that, you don't know, you're kind of thinking, what am I going to do? Okay, I'll give up my job. What am I going to do all day? So therefore, um, very, very important to develop a taste for hearing about Krishna, chanting about Krishna, and being absorbed in transcendental sound vibration. Because that's ultimately where someone has to situate themselves at the end of life. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Um, so this passage is about changing ashrams and changing uh, in life circumstances. But I also wanted to hear your thoughts about changes of service, because a lot of the time we're told that it's good to be attached to a service. So, um, but it does come time to change a service. How do we go about that? Uh, how can we be uh, attached from the material, material aspect or, or our, own, our own conceptions? Yeah. Yeah, how do we become detached from those conceptions and move on to the next service? I would say we have to be committed to a service and attached to the service attitude. When you're given a service, we should be committed because that is the wish of the Vaishnavas and therefore we uh, are very very diligent, very determined, very disciplined in uh, doing that service to the best of our ability. But we shouldn't be attached to a particular service but what we should be attached to is the need to serve. I can't live without service. Uh, that is a devotee's life. A devotee thinks, if I don't have any service, then what's the meaning to my life? Like in the manner we had Jiva Pati Prabhu, who served Radha Gokulananda for many years. I think 40 years. So he was at Watford General at the end of like his final days. So he was kind of going along on the machines and everything. They were giving him medicines. And then one devotee came in one evening and he looked at Jiva Padipu, so he looked very disappointed. So he said, what's the problem? 
He said, the doctor came to me today and the doctor said, there's a chance I can come out of hospital. He said, that's great. Why are you looking so down? So then Jiva Prabhu said to him, but the doctor told me that if I come out of hospital, I'll never be able to do the service that I was doing before. And then he looked at the devotee and said, if I can't do my service, then what's the point of uh, life? So then the devotee walked out and uh, the very next day he left his body. So we can't say, but it may also feel like that, that the devotee loses their will to live when they have no service for Krishna. Because we live to serve, we live to give. No service, no meaning. And so we should be attached to the opportunity to serve. And when we're given a specific service, we should be committed. But then if there is a need, or if the Vaishnavas uh, summon us, um, then we should be ready to be flexible. Remember, be flexible and fearless, not rigid and uh, attached, fearful if we're asked to move on from a specific position. So yeah, it's not easy. Sometimes devotees come and you have to surrender. So, like His Grace Shuri, Shuri Dharma Prabhu, he would call me. And whenever his name would appear on my phone, there were mixed feelings. <laughs> I was very happy because now a sadhu was calling me and yes, some some of opportunity to associate with a sadhu, very nice. But I realized the moment I picked up that phone, there would be some element of surrender required. Uh, some element of surrender that would uh, transpire from this conversation. So the, I, I admitted to him later on, sometimes I also cancelled your call. <laughs> <laughs> I had to psych myself up before, and then I would call you back. So yes, we must, uh, we must be ready to move on. Sometimes services change, positions change. Um, Pariksit was the emperor. And then Krishna just stripped that service away from him. Because Krishna had a bigger service for him. What could be a bigger service than looking after the whole Kingdom. A bigger service is that you reveal Bhagavatam, which will nourish kingdoms and generations to come. Bigger service. So we get taken, one service gets taken away from us, and we have this almost this identity crisis. Like, what will I do? How will I? Do? No, it means Krishna's got a bigger service for you. Krishna's got a bigger service. Prabhupada was always moving. When something didn't work, he moved on, realizing Krishna is a bigger service. It didn't work in Jansi. Later on, Prabhupada realized it was Krishna's mercy. He had a bigger service for me. Imagine that temple in Jansi had worked. Prabhupada would be there in Jansi. Instead, Krishna wanted him to become the founder Acharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness and traveled the world 14 times. But no, Jansi. <laughs> oh, forget Jansi. <laughs> See? So we have to be confident. When Krishna takes one service away, he's got a bigger one round the corner, lined up. Amazing. We have to embrace it. But if we become like Dhritarashtra, holding on, Holding on to your titles, even when everyone is telling you, give it up. Then, better to give it up. Yes. Oh, sorry, on this side. Okay. Okay. All right, we've got it. Okay, it's coming. No one wants to hold on to the mic. <laughs> there you go. Hi, Krishna. Um, so you said that um, 
when we get old, um, it's easier to um, let go uh, of things because we have this extra urgency. That, that Technically, it should be. Yeah. Um, so how can we develop this urgency now uh, without waiting that we get old and that um, we have more regression than how to like um, realize that that can happen at any moment now when we develop that urgency much for our bad life? How can you realize that death will come at any moment? I don't know if you can force that kind of realization. Um, yesterday we talked about seeing death going on all around us. We talked about being always absorbed in the Shastra. Um, I was in Vrindavan this time last year with Kadamakanda Swami. So it was interesting. Uh, someone came, we were in the room in the flat, and then someone came in. So he was saying, like, uh, Yeah, Maharaj, I don't know. Like, I don't have so much impetus. I don't have so much uh, desire. Like, I'm just kind of coasting in my spiritual life. So Maharaj was trying to encourage him. And then he left. And then I was in the room with Maharaj, and Maharaj looked at me and he said, I don't understand these people. He said, every day we're singing, samsara dava nalalita loka. Don't these people understand this world is on fire? He said, we're reading, but we're not actually understanding the urgency of our situation. <coughs> And as he was saying it to me, I was thinking, like, I'm the same. <laughs> so it's interesting, some people, when they read the Bhagavatam, it just clicks. This is an incredibly precarious situation. Kama la dala jiva. Kama la dala jala. Jiva na dala mala. This life is like a drop of water which is tottering on a leaf, at, at any moment it can just slide. How do you force that realization? I don't know. One must uh, become very, very thoughtful. I don't know if you can force it. You have to continue reading. You have to become very, very uh, reflective, very, very introspective. You must keep your eyes open and see the Bhagavatam around you every single day. Otherwise, it's like we live in the class, uh, we hear in the class, and then we go out, and it's almost like, you know, we just cut that. That knowledge is just in one compartmental aspect of our brain, but our vision is something completely different. Shravanam. Mananam, Nididhyasanam, Vandanam. That is said to be the Vedic process of knowledge. So that you have to hear. And then Mananam, you have to think very, very deeply. What does this mean for my life if this knowledge is true? And then Nididhyasanam, you have to start changing the way you operate in this world. And you have to apply that knowledge. And then Vandanam, you have to go in front of Krishna and pray. Krishna, you please awaken this knowledge deep within my heart. So, um, yes, Prabhupada had that conviction. Prabhupada was giving some yas to one of his young disciples, and an old, uh, a reporter came and he said, Prabhupada, Swamiji, sannyas is for old people. Why are you giving sannyas to such a young person? So this young reporter asked. So Prabhupada looked at this young reporter and he said, what does it mean to be old? So he couldn't answer. Prabhupada said to be old means to be close to death. And so Prabhupada looked at this young reporter and said, can you guarantee you will not die before me? And the reporter realized, no, Prabhupada said, you are old, I am old, everyone is old. Because we are old. It's coming, it's right around the corner. Yeah, 
you you can meet actually you meet some devotees who are you can see when you speak to them they just have this very deep realization that my time is ticking uh, I was once with Priyajan Prabhu at the manor I don't know if you've ever seen Priyajan Prabhu but he's like he hardly sleeps he hardly does it like so once I think he was chanting Japa and uh, Anyway, I was falling asleep or something. I mean, he can even also fall asleep while standing up. It's like uh, quite extreme. <coughs> so one time I just said to him, I said, why don't you just move, please take some extra rest. And he just looked at me in the most intense way and he said, I don't have time. I said, why, you have that many services? Like, Understand. Our time. Death is knocking. Death is knocking. So I thought, oh, that's what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> so that was. Uh, so yeah, you have to become. Uh, I don't know, like, what to say more than that. All of us walk out of the door and then the, de the realization has to go deep. No, I didn't oh, okay. Krishna. Hare Krishna. No, Krishna Priyapu will give the real realization. And you can As it happens, you mentioned Persian name. Yes. He's undergoing surgery as of today. Oh, the, okay, the, yeah, of the, course, the, yeah. In, in your place. So, yeah. So all the devotees can pray for him. Yeah. Yeah, very wonderful soul. He is not able to show that was that's what he's saying. He doesn't want to undergo general anesthesia. He will be locked up. Oh, he wants to be in conscious, full consciousness. Well, yes, we are blessed with such saintly people. Something. <coughs> yeah, I was like that. When I joined the Maha, I was like, so I would go to all the funeral programs. Like, whenever they would have the weekly meeting and it was like deciding like who went, I was like, I want to go to all the funeral programs. Yeah, it really helped. <laughs> I mean, it was like, you know. I mean, there's, they do that, right? The yogis, that's why they meditate on the banks of the Ganga Varanasi at the burning ghat. That's why they put ashes on their body. Realize it's coming. So yeah, death is the ultimate meditation to reinstate clarity into every aspect of your life. Therefore the wise person thinks about death regularly. Oh no, I have a Maybe last question. <coughs> So, um, about, uh, or is about that, of course, one devotee um, told me a story that when he was in India, he was going to, was thinking that he was going to leave the body. And while he was leaving the body, he was thinking still to his place, to his wife, that he's a devotee. So my, my question is, why we are going to leave the body, also like thinking of the devotees, instead of maybe directly of Krishna, is that um, we should be absorbed completely in a, in a samadhi stage or thinking to the devotees uh, can be a, a solution for, so we can be attached to the devotees in, in this life so that also in the moment of death it can be helpful 
So should we remember the devotees? Can I say a few things on this? Uh, at a Pando program once, uh, Prabhupada was speaking and then it was in South America. So someone asked the question, it was in Portuguese. So Prabhupada said, so what was he asking? So the devotee translated, he said, Prabhupada, he is asking uh, if he remembers you at the time of death. Will he go back to Godhead? Prabhupada said, that is okay. <laughs> so that's interesting. When we say pure devotion to Krishna, it encompasses Krishna's name, his fame, his form, his devotees, his paraphernalia. If you get attached to any of those things, it's like a train, it's all connected. So if you ca ca catch on to any of those, it takes you. The Bhagavatam confirms this. Once the Swaminarayan sadhus, they had come to the manor. So we were talking about the Bhagavatam. And I asked them, for you, what is the most important verse in Bhagavatam? So he quoted a verse from the third canto of Kapila's instructions. Prashanga majaram parsham atmana karayo vidu saeva sadhushu krito moksha dwaram upadritam. Kapila Dev says to Devahuti, attachment to materialistic people is the greatest source of bondage. Saeva sadhushu krito, but when you transfer that attachment to a saintly person, when you become attached to a saintly person, moksha dvaram, the doors to liberation, apavritam, are opened up. So if you become attached to a sadhu, someone who's completely absorbed in Krishna, naturally you go to Krishna. But the interesting thing is, and I'll just end on this point, in the first canto of the Bhagavatam, when Kunti is praying, she makes an interesting prayer. Atha vishvesha vishvatman vishvamurate svakeshume sneha pasham imam chindi dridam paan dushu vishnishu. Kunti, she prays to Krishna, sever the tie of affection that I have for the Pandavas and the Vishnis. Now, the amazing thing is, who are the Pandavas and the Vishnis? They're the greatest devotees of Krishna. So why is she saying, Sneha Basham, Imam Chindi, slave, uh, sever my tie of affection? You could say that, but they're devotees. It's good to be Moksha Dvaram Abhavritam. But what Queen Kunti knows is that although they're great devotees, because she's in a family relationship with them, there's always the chance that she may have the vision that this is my son, or this is my grandchild, or this is my... So a little bit of that material affection can still come in. And therefore she says, even sever my tie of affection there, because there's a chance that a material bodily concept may come in. So if you become attached to a saintly person, you will go back as long as that attachment to the saintly person is not mixed with any bodily concept of life. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you very much.